You know, when you look at a setting like Battletech, most people would naturally assume it's about giant mechs punching the hell out of each other and shooting the hell out of everything around them, or vice versa, I guess. And you know, it's pretty obvious why if you look at the cover art of, like, every Battletech product ever. Look, it's literally right there for all to see. But just like the average person will never truly understand the uh, incredible depths of knowledge the Man Cave lore masters may have on the topic, said lore masters will never truly grasp the power held by the basement dwelling wizards and the forbidden arcane knowledge they hold. The nerd rabbit hole goes incredibly deep, by the way. For only the most dedicated and rotund dive into the weeds of Battletech and learn it is, in fact, a fully combined arms wargame. Not just mechs, tanks, and helicopters, oh no, it also has aerospace fighters, infantry, and the king of high ground himself, the mighty warship. Yet for the most part, warships and other space-based combat are pretty much totally forgotten, both in lore and in the real-life products like games, tabletop, rule sets, and models like, Jesus, not all of the models around are this, uh, old, but most of them definitely are. So settle in everyone, we're going on an adventure to talk about Battletech's foray into more classic sci-fi tropes like giant spaceships studded in guns and wonderful battles across space with lasers, missiles, and fighter craft. Now, a lot of people know they exist, but I would bet most casual fans have no idea that Aerotech and Battlespace were companion games to Battletech's mechs covering fighters and warship fleets, respectively. They eventually got pushed to the side and forgotten, eventually having the rules just kind of crammed together and unified with Battletech proper in the Strategic Operations Manual, but if I recall correctly, I think they essentially just dumped them in, gave them like 10 pages out of a 300-page manual, and then called it a day. So it's pretty accurate to say that space combat and in-depth standalone rules for aircraft were pretty much just chucked into the fire because you will hear nothing about these things today. No marketing, no hype, nada, outside only the deepest of nerd communities and even then only discussed by the most uh, dwarven looking of Battletech fans. In fact, Google coming to the aid of my lazy ass once again, the last update to the rules was like three pages 25 years ago. Being updated, like, every quarter of a century is pretty on brand for this part of Battletech though, so at least it's lore accurate to the actual setting. The entire reason for this intro before even explaining what the video is truly about is because I want you to understand. Not only in lore after the fall of the Star League, but even in real life, the warships and space combat of the setting is almost forgotten and entirely ignored as a part of Battletech. And that's a shame, because it's incredibly cool and utterly unloved. My heretical hot take being that ships always have been and always will be cooler than mechs, and the mech settings, kick-ass warships being unloved, must be rectified. On the docket for today is a brief history of the real-world games and stuff, the history of warships in the setting and why they disappeared, the stylistic and substantive differences, or in more layman's terms, what's different between the various models and the factions and setting and stuff, then finishing off with a few fun facts or interesting things about them in the setting that I think is just super unique. But before we get into the video proper, if you enjoy this video, then leave a like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, all that good stuff, since it really does help, especially for a smaller channel like this that's making more niche content. Or if you're feeling generous, check out Sai's Patreon and buy me a coffee. We also have a Discord if more casual hangouts with fellow Turbo Nerds sound appealing. We trade trash memes, talk about sci-fi, and enjoy nerd hobbies together. Everything linked in the description below. And with that, time for spaceships. Fair warning though, my brain is a dumpster fire most of the time, so you'll hear me use names like Aerospace, Aerotech, Battlespace, and Battletech completely interchangeably, despite all of them being demonstrably different things. That's because my brain forgets sometimes that they are different, and since they all sound the same, it just goes, eh, close enough for government work and just staples it in there. So, back on track. Fittingly enough, the space-based portion of Battletech setting actually started as a sort of prequel to the tabletop games and conflicts fought in the main setting. While most people will be familiar with building a lance, or several, worth of mechs, tanks, and hovercraft to murder each other before subsequently missing every shot because your opponent used the unbelievably arcane strategy of squatting in the light woods, the basic premise being, wait a minute, what about all the fighting that probably happens trying to actually land those ground forces that are abusing the local forests? And thus, Aerotech was formed, the chronological prequel of the kind of fights that are going to be happening in Battletech. It encompasses space and atmosphere-capable fighters, bombers, and various kinds of light-to-heavy dropships. 
the goal of the game was varied and often asymmetrical. Sometimes it would be straight deathmatch, just like in Battletech, but it also focused on defense and attack missions where one side would be trying to protect landing dropships from the defending force of aerospace fighters that was attempting to obliterate them. However, Aerotech wasn't particularly successful, mostly due to, well, the competition from the battle mechs. Surprise, surprise, with the advertising in the state of the universe, most people came to Battletech for the unique flavor of heavy metal hardware blowing each other up on the ground, not space combat. The other issue was that aerospace, from what I've managed to find, had distinctly mediocre rules. The basic newbie version of the game rules were fun, but simple and easy to exhaust, while the full rule set was overcomplicated and often caused pointless calculations, rolling, and wasted time that dragged games out a lot longer than they needed to go. Once again, I've never played it, so I'm going off of forum discussions, wikis, and old news about it, so it could be a little bit wrong here, but if you want to leave corrections in the comments, feel free. But from what I understand, the fighters and stuff were still fun, they had been reasonably pruned down and gotten into a pretty good playable state, but the warships required a PhD in theoretical mathematics to play properly, or some shit. So if calculating the relative velocities and headings of your ships as they drifted around in space trying to nuke each other sounds like a head-scratcher, don't worry, you're right. It was widely praised as being incredibly interesting and fun once you got it down, but widely panned and ridiculed for being so complicated to learn and with so much fucking math that people just said screw it and went back to mechs and tanks. And if you know how much math goes into Battletech regularly, that is a statement and a half for the community to be like, no, it's too technical, I give up. And as such, Battlespace died a miserable quiet death as people just shrugged and left it to collect dust. Anyways, overall, the space version of Battletech was a huge flop, so the rules got folded into regular Battletech and most of the units became a sort of battlefield support thing while the warships just straight up got forgotten. You can still buy minis for them, for third party sellers or resellers, but they're so old, dear god. Metal Cast 2, ouch, that's uh, it's a bit of a hassle to paint. That, for the most part, is it. This part of Battletech is forgotten, which is kind of depressing, but on the bright side, the lore and in-universe portrayal is so much more rich, so much more vibrant, so much cooler and more interesting, and almost just as forgotten or consigned to small portions of grander stories. It's incredibly depressing. Makes a grown man want to cry. So let's talk about the history of warship development in Battletech. What these ships actually are in Battletech has a very specific set of criteria that need to be checked off for it to fit. A lot of settings will simply go with whatever the building nation calls it, so if it's called a Star Destroyer, that's its class, despite it demonstrably being a battleship or super battleship compared to pretty much everything else that's going to be fighting in its peer setting. Another example would be the Battlestars from BSG. There's really no set list of requirements that make a ship a Battlestar or preclude it from being one. It's just sort of hand wavy -um. Well, it's big, blocky, and covered in guns with the flight pods, so I guess a Battlestar it shall be, despite multiple other vessels fitting those criteria just being slightly smaller. In Battletech, though, the aerospace assets that are known as warships are varied and diverse, but all fall under a single, overarching design umbrella. The three primary criteria are as follows. Number one, the ship must be independently jump or FTL capable. Mounting a compact jump drive, if it needs to hitch a ride on a jump ship or something, it's not a real warship. Number two, the ship must be, well, designed for combat. Duh. Mounting heavy armor, redundant systems, and capital grade weapons. Technically any ship with a compact jump drive and used for military operations would be a quote unquote warship but they would be more accurately classified as logistics craft or something else in the third line of battle rather than an actual proper warship. And finally, the vessel must be capable of considerable maneuverability or thrust. There are semi-mobile space stations and logistics ships in Battletech that fit the first two criteria but can barely move. Warships in Battletech are deceptively fast, frighteningly fast, in fact, as they can, at a bare minimum, hit a single G of thrust in every direction, or multiple Gs in line with their main engines. These massive mountains of metal and guns can say hold my beer, and in lore keep up with fighters and transports in a straight line if they're really burning hard. And I mean, it makes sense. The majority of them have engines that look like this. It's like a third of the mass of the ship. It kind of makes sense that it would have that much of an oomph. If a vessel doesn't fit all three of those criteria, it isn't a warship. 
instead falling into the myriad of scout logistics support or rear echelon designations that infest every military organization ever. The very first warship ever produced was the Dreadnought, aptly named in the 2300s, fielded by the Terran Alliance well before the formation of the Star League and the various treaties prohibiting the use of nuclear weapons and total war strategies. The first ever showing of the warship's firepower in the setting was when Admiral McKenna used the new ship to vaporize several uninhabited islands of not insignificant size from orbit. Which is a wonderful way to test a new weapon system, and something that we have both done in real life and should continue doing because it's funny. The aggressive pursuit of these warships thereafter would pave the way for the Terran hegemony and the core of power that would bring about the Star League. Over the centuries, the warship would become a staple in Battletech's conflicts, evolving and growing larger and more powerful with every new iteration and design. The very earliest ship, the Dreadnought, was fairly standard sci-fi in its design, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. It's pretty blech in how it stands out. But later versions would begin to run into and solve problems that are unique to space and genuinely really unique to Battletech's art style. You see, in Battletech, mechs have something called heat sinks. Essentially, the fusion power plant at the heart of the machine creates a shitload of heat, like an absolutely unmanageable amount of it, and they need a whole bunch of extra heat sinks outside of the engine to efficiently transfer all of that heat to the surroundings and exterior of the mech so that it doesn't melt. In a lot of mechs, if you crit out enough of the heat sinks, you don't even need to kill it, and it doesn't even need to fire its weapons to start rapidly overheating and be forced to either shut down or literally melt as the sun powering it slags the internals. For warships, the, the problem is even worse. Not only are the power plants absolutely colossal in scale due to both needing to, well, power the ship and its jump drive, but space is a notoriously trash conductor of heat, and radiation is incredibly slow. As such, later designs of warships, mostly but not always, would include massive armored radiators on the ships, giving them an almost fish or in some cases flower-like look to them. These massive radiators were full of heat sinks and had a thermal conveyor to the power plant to pull heat away from the core and disperse it out into space at a reasonable rate. Because when a mech melts down, it, it just melts down. Maybe it explodes. When a warship melts down, well, there doesn't tend to be much left of it afterwards. This is one of those things that's also super cool to me, because how many sci-fi ships do you see actually look anything like this? I think Battletech's warships in general are bugly. Like, they do not look sleek or deadly or stylish at all, but that's what makes them perfect. They are quite literally a case of, it's so fugly, I love it. Just like most battle mechs, they look and feel like someone designed a weapon first and then let form follow function. It's also important to mention, I'm going to be using a lot of fan art or artist reinterpretations for this video since there is some really good old official art, but there's also a lot of really old and kind of mech art. I mean, they're, they're like 45 years old, almost 50 years old by this point. Also, Oof. Sorry to my older viewers for implying 45 or 50 is super old. You're not super old. You're vintage. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. Similar to the Mackie, the first battle mech ever made, every faction would start out imitating or copying the Terran hegemony, but would gradually start producing more flavorful or unique designs. The Draconis Combine had a lot of warships being dagger or blade shaped, angled and thin to minimize their forward profile while bringing most of their direct fire weapons to bear, the Fed Sons have more generalist warships, big in a mix of blocky and rounded designs that mix laser, missile, and autocannon systems with fighter bay and support craft, so they're overall generalists. The Lyrans, well, they make giant brick shithouse designs because how dare anyone have bigger things than them. Even the clans, for their domestically produced ships and not the ones they carried with them during the Exodus, have a far more modern, sleek, and built-to-fight look than most of the earlier designs from the Inner Sphere all of which lets you sort of distinguish who they fight for and what they're meant to do, and just like with mechs, it's not super clear-cut since political scheming, backroom deals, and outright theft of resources means everyone has at least a few of every warship type, but for the most part, each major faction has their own flavor and style. That is, until, of course, the Dark Ages of space combat. During the height of the Star League, mankind could muster thousands of dedicated warships, not support craft or subcapital vessels, oh no, they had probably millions of those. I'm talking about thousands of mainline, 
front and center capital scale warships. Enough firepower that a small fraction of that could level entire worlds to atomic glass in an afternoon. And for a while, this fleet pretty much nullified large-scale wars, alongside the political acumen of the Star League at the time, because the only ability for any factions to take worlds over were mass landings of mechs, tanks, and infantry. The hard counter to actually getting them there to the planet was a fleet of warships hanging around in orbit ready to dropkick the entire coming invasion straight to hell. Parry this, you filthy casual, the Admiral says, firing an autocannon the size of a skyscraper. And that's pretty much why during the Star League Civil War and soon to follow First and Second Succession Wars, warships and their massive engagements in orbit were the deciding factor of entire campaigns. Not the battle mechs or foot soldiers, no matter what any revisionist lore or propaganda might say, Battletech was utterly dominated by these vessels for hundreds of years, and the only time the ground pounders got to really enjoy their day in the sun was when the forces in orbit let them, as establishing orbital control and superiority was pretty much the number one priority in any planetary invasion. Unfortunately, during the Succession Wars, the incredible value of these weapons meant they had a massive target on their backs. Sabotage, lightning raids, full orbital bombardments of infrastructure, and dickery from Comstar meant that slowly, then quicker, then suddenly all at once, the various great houses lost the ability to build new, then replace old, then refit or repair current warships. The most depressing part of the story and space combat in Battletech is just like everything else high-tech and cool in the setting, we can't have nice things, the Succession Wars didn't destroy them in a climactic, epic duel. It probably would have been a lot cooler and more satisfying to see the last few hundred of them rip one another apart over some contested planet, the last great naval battle, or some such schlock like that. But instead, they became ever rarer, ground down more by a lack of maintenance and facilities than any actual combat, until eventually, there were only a few hundred left scattered across the inner sphere, barely functional, derelict, or forever mothballed and unable to be repaired, stripped for parts, or just lost to time over hundreds of years of war. By the time of the clan invasion, roughly 3057, there were no functional warships left in the inner sphere. Only a rare few museum pieces that were heavily stripped down and left in the collections of the Great Houses, continuing to rot away in silence. And speaking of the clan invasion, this was the spark that reignited warship production and reminded the Inner Sphere why their battle mechs mean absolutely nothing in the face of overwhelming firepower from the ultimate high ground. The Helm Memory Core was rediscovered by this point, and had a massive amount of lost tech and aided greatly in the rebuilding effort of the Inner Sphere from the unbelievable ravages of the Succession Wars, and they had begun to successfully reintroduce the tech and infrastructure needed to support these incredible vessels, but it was very slow, as the lessons and the tactics of old didn't die overnight, the idea of warfare in the Inner Sphere was deeply entrenched over like 300-400 years of succession warfare, and they weren't going to give it up quickly, so most of that knowledge and information went into building new jump ships, which the Inner Sphere was also very limited on, new drop ships, new transports, and all of that kind of stuff. But when the clans invaded, their small fleets of anywhere from only as little as two to ten warships rendered Inner Sphere tactics utterly void. Even in the modern Battletech day, warships, while once again taking to the void, are very rare. Some nations like the Capellans or the Free Worlds League that are just constantly, permanently in a state of turmoil and uber poverty can't really construct anything and are struggling to repair and bring into service captured, old, or disabled ships in their collections while the most powerful, rich, or developed states like the Draconis Combine, Federated Sons, and Lyran Commonwealth can manage maybe two or three refits at a time or building one new ship from scratch for their entire nation of dozens or hundreds of planets. And that's because the scale and cost of effort needed is absolutely monstrous. And for the most part, that's where the history of the warships in Battletech ends. They're amazing, they're awesome, and they go almost entirely forgotten by the vast majority of the community, aside from the acknowledgement that, yeah, they existed. And now, 
Let's talk a little bit about some of the cooler parts about them, since while I am a Battletech nerd, I am a sci-fi geek in general, first and foremost. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was the fins on their ships. I touched on the radiators before, and that's what they usually are, at least that's what the really big ones usually are, but they also have a secondary purpose, being the solar collectors that you see on jump ships. And this is genuinely one of the coolest things in sci-fi. I love this. It's fantastic. Let me explain why. You see, regular civilian jump ships have reactors and could charge the jump drive with them, but just very slowly since the energy isn't exactly enough. So what they do to supplement that is use the fan-like prongs on their base, the big umbrella-looking structure, to deploy an absolutely colossal solar panel. I'm talking like dozens or hundreds of kilometers square on average. These things are massive, soaking up as much of the energy from their local star as possible to help them charge a jump. And even with this cutting down a huge percent of the charge time, it still takes days, sometimes weeks, to actually charge and get ready to go FTL. Warships having the same system is amazing. It shows a consistency in the universe's lore and is really cool to see that they decided to use a cool solution rather than an easy one. The easy solution would have been to just say, nah, the reactors are powerful enough to charge a jump alone, issue solved. But they went out of their way to design the ships with larger anchor points near the rear or midsection of the ships that they can deploy these solar sails from. Not only do most of them double as radiators during combat, but it's so rare and so cool to see, like, pseudo-logistic stuff actually added in that I feel, I feel it's worth a mention. This image right here as well, this is my all-time favorite. This is fan art, by the way, but I choose to believe that it's what they actually look like. This sort of NASA punk slash modern sci-fi design, like, I just love it. It's such an excellent visual design. In my mind, every vessel is drawn in this art style because it's just so goddamn good. I'm also like 95% sure that this redesign is of the McKenna class, the actual name of that warship type, but I'm not 100% sure on it, so if anybody does know for sure, let me know in the comments. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that most of these are hybrid carriers. Battletech is one of those universes where its spacecraft are so big that adding a little more on to let a ship carry fighters is not only perfectly reasonable, but extremely common. It's very, very common for warship classes to have smaller hangar ports on their side to not only let small number of fighters and bombers and stuff go, but also to carry shuttles and small transports. While it's not at all uncommon to see warships like this on screen with massive hangars bolted onto them, capable of carrying dropships, entire squadrons of aerospace fighters, or hordes of bombers. It's similar to Star Wars in that way, where there are dedicated carriers, but a capital ship not carrying any sort of, like, fighters or snub craft is pretty much entirely unheard of. And that's pretty much the end of everything I wanted to talk about. Before we end off, I want to ask one more time to anyone that just made it this far, if you enjoy the video, like, subscribe, all that, and I know a lot of people think doing it at the beginning is tacky, but the average YouTube video loses two-thirds of its viewers after the first 10% of the video, so adding it near the start is provably better for the channel's analytics, which is why I do it. Before I fully end off the video, however, to the people who go above and beyond to support the channel, a huge thanks to Size Patrons. You help keep things running smoothly on the back end and let me spend more of my time on this rather than actually working or going out there with a special thanks to all the members of the $5 tier. David G, the original Augie, Levin Brova Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, the other ones, Silencer, Vox Apollyon, Phoenix, BT Legend, Electro Boy 11, Logan Maynard, Mickey, David Armon, Creed Dome, Robin Stoppett, Fenrir Striker, Tachi Takane, He's Deb, Pixie, Virtus, Fabric 445, Anchovy Bob, Mini Crustacean, Charles the Snap, Paul Eric Jones, Joseph Holiday, Zombie the Zerker, David B, Sweet B, Rastro, Le Butcher, Stabby Taco, Nomquam, Brian Hall, John Gabriel, Joshua J. Lee, The Hay Fork, Unit Zero, Tarly Bob, Kiwi Warrior, Douglas Jerema, Jason Vigo, Screaming Stuka, Darius D, Exothermic, Roscoe, Christoph Grimberg, Baron AJ, CT7274, Freedom Trooper, Steven Ventura, and I believe reasonably new people, Zephyr Windstar, Harbinger029, Oscar Reed, and Skogan. Thank you very much for your support. I hope it'll continue in the future. You guys are absolutely fantastic. And with that, the video is functionally over. I have nothing else to say. Goodbye.